So to continue what was left of part one of the review for diabetes. The diagnosis of diabetes mellitus is made through one of four methods. These methods and criteria for diagnosis are as follows. Hemoglobin A1C level 6.5% or higher. Fasting blood glucose level or FBG higher than 126 mg per deciliter. Fasting is referred to as no caloric intake for at least 8 hours, meaning fasting for at least 8 hours. 2 hour plasma glucose level during the oral glucose tolerance test 200 mg per deciliter or higher with a glucose load of 75 grams. In a patient with classic symptoms of hyperglycemia, which is polyuria, polydipsia, and unexplained weight loss, or hyperglycemic crisis, a random plasma blood glucose level of 200 mg per deciliter or higher. If a patient presents with hyperglycemic crisis or clear symptoms of hyperglycemia, which is polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia, unexplained weight loss, with a random blood, with a random plasma glucose level of 200 or higher, a repeat testing is not warranted. Otherwise, criteria one through three should be confirmed by a repeat testing to rule out lab errors. It is preferable for the repeat test to be the same test used initially. For example, if a random blood glucose test showed elevated blood glucose levels, the same test should be used again when the person is retested. The accuracy of test results depends on adequate patient preparation and attention to the many factors that may influence test results. For example, factors that can cause falsely elevated values include recent severe restrictions of dietary carbohydrates, acute illness, medications, examples, um, contraceptives and corticosteroids, and restricted activities such as bed rest. A patient with impaired GI absorption or who has recently taken acetaminophen may have false negative test results. The hemoglobin A1c reflects the amount of glycosylated hemoglobin as a percentage of total hemoglobin. Example, a hemoglobin A1c of 6.5% means that 6.5% of the total hemoglobin has glucose attached to it. The amount of hemoglobin that is glycosylated or glycosated depends on the blood glucose level. When blood glucose levels are elevated over time, the amount of glucose attached to hemoglobin molecules increase. This glucose remains attached to the red blood cells for the life of the red blood cell, which is approximately 120 days or about 3 months. Therefore, the hemoglobin A1c test provides a measurement of glycemic control over the previous 2-3 to three months with the increases in the A1C reflecting elevated blood glucose level, or in other words, poor glucose control. The hemoglobin A1C test has several advantages over the FPG or the fasting prandial glucose test, including greater convenience because fasting is not required. Diseases affecting RBCs, example, iron deficiency anemia or sickle cell anemia, can influence the hemoglobin A1c level and should be considered in interpreting test results. All patients with diabetes and prediabetes should have their hemoglobin A1c monitored regularly to determine the success of the current treatment plan and make changes in the plan if glycemic goals are not achieved. The ADA, the American Diabetes Association, identifies A1c goal for patients with diabetes of less than 7%. The American College of Endocrinology recommends a hemoglobin A1c level of less than 6.5%. When the hemoglobin A1c level is maintained at near normal levels, there is 
a greatly reduced risk for the development of microvascular and macrovascular complications. For individuals with prediabetes, hemoglobin A1c level can help detect overt diabetes and provide patients with feedback regarding efforts to prevent diabetes. The goals of diabetes management are to reduce symptoms, promote well-being, prevent acute complications of hyperglycemia, and prevent or delay the onset and development of long-term complications. Maintaining blood sugar levels as near to normal will help manage these goals. Diabetes is a chronic disease that requires daily decisions about food intake, blood glucose testing, medications, and exercise. Patient teaching, which enables the patient to become the most active participant in his or her own care, is essential <laughs> for a successful treatment plan. Nutritional therapy, drug therapy, exercise, and self-monitoring of blood glucose are tools used in the management of diabetes. For some people with type 2 diabetes, a regimen of proper nutrition regular physical activity and maintenance of desirable body weight is sufficient to attain an optimal level of blood glucose control. However, for the majority, drug therapy is necessary. The major types of glucose lowering agents used in the treatment of diabetes are insulin, oral agents, and non-insulin injectable agents. All individuals with type 1 diabetes requires insulin. So to summarize, diabetes mellitus is a chronic multi-system disorder of glucose metabolism related to absent or insufficient insulin, impaired utilization of insulin or both. There are four main types or classes of diabetes, but type 1 and type 2 diabetes are the most important. Uh, type 1 diabetes, there is absolutely no insulin production and in type 2, um, there is insulin produced, but the body is, is not able to utilize it properly, or there is insufficient insulin. Prediabetes is when the blood glucose levels are higher than normal, but not high enough to give the diagnosis of diabetes. Um, Anti-diabetics, um, insulin and oral hypoglycemic agents are used in managing diabetes. Um, Self-management of uh, glucose is an important aspect in containing diabetes and to prevent its complications. Nursing management of diabetes mellitus would include for the patient receiving insulin, proper administration, assessment of the patient's response to insulin therapy, and teaching of the patient regarding administration of adjustment to and side effects of insulin, particularly recognition and management of hypoglycemia by using the teach back method. Proper administration and assessment of the patient's use of and response to oral and non-insulin injectable agents as well as teaching of the patient and family about these drugs are all part of the nurse's function. The goals of diabetes self-management education are to enable the patient to become the most active participant in his or her care while matching the level of self-management to the ability of the individual patient.